Thank you all very much for being here this evening for what I know you will find a very interesting program. I'd like to just make two short announcements. On May 18th, we have Mr. Ben Jack, Vice President of External Relations for the World Bank, as our speaker. And on May 25th, we have Mr. Helmut Sonnenfeld, who is with the Brookings Institute, and uh, who will talk to us about prospects for the U.S. Soviet relations. And I'll turn the meeting over to our Executive Director, Dr. Bird, for introduction. <laughs> We're delighted to have the uh, Japan Caravan with us again. They were our guests two years ago, as many of you recall. Uh, for those of you who weren't here at that time, the Japan Caravan um, is uh, sponsored by several organizations, the uh, Japan Society in the United States primarily. Its purpose is to encourage improved relations between the United States and Japan. And indeed, it's been a uh, successful venture. I'm always impressed by the willingness of uh, um, people from Japan to participate in this caravan, and these gentlemen are, are, are doing so quite, quite graciously. Uh, they will visit uh, seven American cities, this particular team. They've already been to four, and they'll visit New York and Washington uh, after leaving Baltimore. They've been here since yesterday, and have had an opportunity to see uh, uh, various parts of Baltimore and to meet with several small groups. In any case, we're delighted that they'll be addressing the council tonight. Let me very briefly uh, introduce our three panelists to you. Uh, Mr. Kobayashi, who is seated in the center, is a professor of international management at Sano Institute of Business Administration in Tokyo, where he specializes in industrial productivity and international comparative management. He's a graduate of Tokyo, uh, Tokyo University Law School, and he studied on a Fulbright scholarship here in the United States. He's worked with uh, a number of major uh, international firms, both Japanese and American. Um, he has been a, uh, in addition he's the, uh, to his present responsibilities at Sano, he's a director of the International Education Center. He's taught at the Institute of International Studies in Tokyo. He's lectured widely in Asia, Europe, and the United States. He served as a consultant to the Japan Overseas Enterprise Association, the Asian Non-Manual Workers Conference, the Japanese Ministry of Justice, Chase Manhattan Bank, IBM, and numerous other firms. His publications have included articles in Fortune and the Columbia Journal of World Business. He's the author of a recent book, Introduction to International Management. He's presently serving as Chairman of International Communications at the Ministry of International Trade and Industry. Our second panelist is Mr. Fujiwara, who is currently Deputy Director of International Economic Affairs, the International Economic Affairs Department at the Federation of Economic Organizations, Adonna. Um, before assuming his current post, he was Senior Assistant Director of the Science and Energy Department of that same organization. From 1976 to 78, he served as Assistant Director of the Industrial Affairs Department before being transferred to the Science and Energy Department. Our third panelist is a journalist, Mr. Masami. He's a graduate of the Tokyo Faculty of Law joined uh, Yomiura Shimbun, Japanese newspaper, in 1971. He's currently a political staff writer for that newspaper. He's the co-author of several publications, Administrative Reform and Documentary Administrative Reform. Uh, these three gentlemen have agreed to make short presentations of eight to ten minutes, after which we'll have the opportunity to address questions to them. Our meeting should end by approximately ten minutes after. Seven. Each of their topics will be a little different. I think you'll find them interesting. And as I say, we'll have a good opportunity to ask questions. It's, uh, it gives us a great deal of pleasure to welcome these three distinguished Japanese visitors to Baltimore. Thank you for a very kind introduction, Dr. Bird. And also, 
Uh, before we make our presentation, uh, let me thank to World well, Trade Council for organizing this wonderful opportunity for sharing some of our ideas and exchanging views with you uh, on behalf of all these uh, three Japanese caravan, somewhat tired uh, camels, and uh, <laughs> I would like to appreciate that. Since I read to all of you here, this is a large group of audience, and I think all three camels are a little bit uh, uh, scared to uh, uh, see you. But anyhow, um, and personally, I'm very happy to be able to come back to this dynamic uh, historic city of Baltimore. Uh, it is not because I hear so often from our city planning uh, people and agencies that you have been able to successfully implement the, the uh, rejuvenate, rejuvenate or you have been able to successful urban redevelopment uh, case, but nor I was uh, able to visit the uh, Black Street. Uh, is it Black Street anymore? Uh, during my during my school day, some quarter of a century ago, when I was uh, granted a one-year grant uh, to prove my scholarship in New York City on Manhattan colleges. But uh, I was asked like, by a good friend of mine, why don't you go to the Black Street where I had the first exposure to the beautiful street teasing in my stu stu exchange student that's coming all the way from New York to uh, over here. Uh, well, this is not the reason. Because and also, it is, not, it is simply because I can enjoy your world-reputed, renowned the Chesapeake Steam Club. So that was it's a dynamite. And, uh, <laughs> what I learned last night uh, from one of the Japanese businessmen here, that now the true Japanese businessman is exporting not only your eels to Japan, but also now in the process of uh, exporting Chesapeake uh, Steam Club to, uh, to Japan, so I don't have to come all, all the way to enjoy your wonderful crabs. But then, Seriously, I would like to, uh, I'm very happy to be able to come back to this part of the world and uh, I'm very much impressed yesterday and today with such a good program going on. So this area is completely changed and quite different image from the image I used to have some uh, quarter of a century ago. Uh, before we begin our presentation, uh, uh, let me ask you very briefly, how many of you have ever been to Japan? Uh, Oh, yes, sir. Thank you very much, very much. Uh, and also, uh, uh, how many of you have ever been to the Far East, in China, Hong Kong, all these areas? Oh, well, oh, well. Uh, the reason why I asked you is that uh, uh, some also uh, quarter of a century ago, I learned at Manhattan College when I took the course of marketing and. Uh, before you do anything, you have to uh, analyze your audiences. Yes? So you have to uh, uh, find out what the needs of the client. This is the beginning, and uh, this is the first lesson of management and marketing. So uh, applying the old techniques of American management, I, I just uh, try to find out what are some of the interest areas that you might have in, and uh, how well you are sophisticated in the area of the Japanese management and the uh, FSC. Uh, the Speaking of the marketing or management, uh, you might have, all of you who have been to Japan, you might have the chance to visit the one of the very, very old gate uh, called the Shogun Gate at the place called the Nikko, which is, uh, it's about one on uh, by uh, express train uh, Nikko, and still you can see the, the shrine of, so your shrine called the Toshoku Shrine, uh, in which you can have a wonderful gate called the Yome Gate. This shrine happened to be dedicated uh, to the first shogun Tokugawa Ieyasu, and still you can see even now the very, very beautiful and uh, real life like the sculpture of a cat, uh, we call it sleeping cat. And then this reminds me of the story, which uh, is a real story of the, the uh, sculptor who made, actually made that the sleeping cat. Uh, after uh, some time, after the, I think it's immediately after he has finished this carving of a sleeping cat on the Yome gate at the Toshogun, uh, where the Shogun was enshrined. Uh, one of the very famous priests heard of the story of a wonderful masterpiece the, of the sculptor. The sculptor's name is Hidami Jingoro, we call it Jingoro the left handed. And so he asked the Jingoro the left handed to carve a curve, a, a lifelike moth uh, 
to for him. And after three months of uh, very painstaking work, Dingo the left handed, uh, he brought to the priest a, a real uh, lifelike uh, mouth. And so the priest was very much impressed with that, but uh, the story did not end here. And the priest, who is very much, uh, shall we say, quality minded, this is the beginning of the quality control concept in Japan some 300 years ago, uh, tried to test whether or not this the real life that must will prove his cat. So he brought the cat uh, from his uh, the, ne the next room, and the cat, as soon as this, he saw the real life like mouse, curved mouse, jumped on and pounced on, her, on the on the the the, the, uh, the mouth. And the story did not end here either. Uh, why this cat jump on this mouse? It is because the very clever market minded or client center jingle or the left handed call this real life like mouse not out of wood but out of the dry fish of Katsuro Bushi. <laughs> so, when we hear very often that the, the so called successful marketing of Japanese automotive industry in the United States, we, we can't help uh, recalling the story at the beginning of the quality minded uh, marketing oriented, quality minded uh, priest and the marketing minded uh, Hidari Chingolo. Uh, anyhow, the joking aside, I think I think I have to be back to the serious topics of uh, some of sharing some of my observations in the area of uh, uh, the US Japan relations. The looking back uh, for the past three or four years, uh, the US Japan relationship. Uh, I would like to point out a very interesting changes or the development, uh, particularly in the area of management, the concept of management, which I specialize uh, with several different phases. In 1979, the NBC video program, if when if Japan can, why can't we? I think most of you have seen this kind of very good video program seems to have triggered an enormous interest in the Japanese ways of management and Japanese ways of human resources management. And then the Ezra Bogels, the Dr. Ezra Bogels book, the Harvard professor, the Japan as number one, uh, seems to have reinforced this interest into the management uh, techniques and concept of the, in the Japanese enterprises. Incidentally, his book initially sold in Japan, in, in, in uh, America, only 35, 36,000 copies in English in the hard one, hard one's cover. But in Japan, this book sold uh, 360,000 copies in translation. Because Japanese Japanese people thought, uh, misinterpreted the title of the book, Japan as number one, the original title, but we thought Japan is the number one. <laughs> we have been suffering such a long time, time shall we say, a frustration. And so this book seems to have provided certain kind of consolation to this kind of uh, Japanese people who have suffered from the inferiority complex for the past uh, 30 years. But anyhow, this book and also the next book, uh, Uriyama Uchi, the Uchi the book, there will be, I think most of you have a chance to read or at least read the review of the book, there will be what we can learn from the Japanese management and enhance this kind of a fever to an industry. So I think to most of you, the QC circle, Lifetime employment, seniority system, uh, amicable labor management relation, singing company songs, and uh, morning pep talks, and morning exercise of finance. And uh, uh, this, this seems to have become almost household names uh, in the American business community by the end of 1980. However, to learn from Japan, uh, shall we say, passion or passion to have gradually ebbed away as the American managers. Uh, became uh, more confident of the way they do in the United States. Also, uh, they have become more, uh, shall we say, fed up with the stories of how wonderful the miraculous the Japanese uh, uh, are and how productive, the, productive we are. So, when Mr. Adam Fris uh, attacked in the Esquire magazine, he's called in the Blue Melbourne Arts of the Japanese Management Style, and the CBS carried a series of articles on the dark sides and negative sides of Japanese social lives, such as uh, very severe and strenuous entrance exam for the kids, and uh, big career dropout of the Japanese businessmen. Some of the American businessmen seems to have applauded these programs and have found some source in knowing the Japanese are neither necessarily omnipotent uh, beings 
and we are neither more angels or more monsters, we are, uh, we are just like an ordinary human beings. In eight, 1982, the interest in the Japanese business organizational behavior has definitely marked a new uh, departure. Uh, when your Daniel Yankovich depicted, depicted in his new rule, I think it was about uh, February last year, uh, once selfish oriented needs of the generation in the United States is gradually turning into the exploration of the new commitment. Herman Kahn, your futurist, uh, futurologist guru, predicted uh, last year that the long term recovery of American economic, political, and social activities in the optimistic analysis of the coming boom. And then the one minute manager written by Kenneth Brancher, uh, I think uh, this book is enjoying the number one, number two on the non fiction list right now in the United States. And uh, Spencer Johnson, uh, the defiant report claims many Japanese, I quote, many beliefs that it, it will soon be regard, recognized as the answer to the nation holding productivity America, <coughs> uh, the answer to um, uh, holding productivity and America's answer to Japan theory D. The incidentally John Nesby, the author of another top seller, Mega Trends, uh, warns that, I quote, that Japan is number one, but that is like a new world champion in a declining uh, sport. So, the, in the third ranked top seller, In Search of Excellence, um, uh, written by Waterman and uh, Peters, uh, however, made another uh, big stride into the different phase in the study of effective manager practices. On the basis of analysis of the 42 high-performing <coughs> American companies which have been able to sustain their strong position for the past 20 years, they were able to identify the important common disciplines in management, namely KISS using the computer and jargons, KISS, keep it simple, dash, stupid. So <laughs> the, they also I seem to have identified three fundamental disciplines in these effectively operated companies, do it and fix it and try it. And we can't help thinking, um, recording again, that these are the things that we do very, very carefully. Uh, when the Harvard professor, Dr. Hayes, came over to Japan some four years ago, um, he tried to identify the oriental mystique and some gimmicks in doing business in, in Japan. But what he found there, instead of the gimmicks, was nothing but the, the constant painstaking effort of practicing what we have preached for us for the past 30 years in the area of management. The, he has found in Japanese practice that uh, they, they everybody is trying to remove the Murphy out of the uh, machines. And they try to uh, not to overload the machines. They try to make the places clean enough and, uh, uh, the, uh, so that we will be able to have comfortable workshops. So to me, this is the very important, your awareness and our, our awareness, that there is no nationality for the good management, for the good high-performing companies, uh, be it in the United States, be it in Japan. Uh, good management, it seems to me to have shared the same very important uh, areas of, uh, uh, shall we say, good discipline and good practices. And so I think uh, the, both the Japanologists in, in the United States and American watchers in Japan, including me, Knowingly or unknowingly, seems to have made an excessive emphasis on the to give you the impression that cross-cultural differences between both countries are so great <coughs> that unless the any organization or rely upon good advice of them, the companies will never be able to succeed in their ventures abroad. Uh, of course, the, the difference is interesting. The difference is much more interesting than the commonality or the universality. Of course, there are uh, many, many different kinds. The, the emphasis. It, on the differences, sometimes very important, uh, so that we will not be said to believe that everything is the same in the USA and Japan. Uh, of, however, I have to warn you, and I have to warn to ourselves, that emphasis, excessive emphasis on the, dif the differences sometimes lead to the conclusion that uh, lead to the stereotype and ways of understanding your system and our system. For instance, many people believe that the Japanese so-called talks about the Japanese a lifetime employment system, lifelong employment system. This is quite uh, not so. The so-called lifetime employment system, uh, lifelong employment system is only to apply to the 28% of the Japanese workforce. So 72% of workforces are quite mobile. 
There are many part-time workers who are seasonal workers who are the immigrant workers. So there is a mobility, definitely mobility in the Japanese workforce. So the concept of lifetime employment is quite mistaken. This is only applied to the large enterprises. And when you speak of the Japanese wages solely based on seniority, this is quite uh, wrong. The about 30 or 40 percent of the uh, the the wages wages are determined not by seniority, not by education, determined by the performance or the uh, the, the jobs uh, jobs and so on. And also the when you say the Japanese labor management division, there's nothing but the paternalistic division. This is quite wrong. We have a so-called uh, enterprise or union, enterprise-based union, but they are not necessarily a company-dominated unions. Uh, yes, they are more pro collaborative with employees when they want to enlarge the, the pie to be shared by them. They do collaborate with the employee, employers. However, when they come to the negotiation table to share the pie, they do fight very fiercely. fiercely. So, until some of the understanding seems to be, uh, if you place an excessive emphasis on the differences, it's quite misleading. So I think what I'd like to uh, emphasize here today is uh, maybe we should, uh, uh, both, of, both of the United States and Japan has come to the stage that we should try to identify more common, similar things which are universal, regardless of the nationality. And uh, on the basis of the survey for the past two or three years, we have uh, identified some of the major uh, co common elements which can be seen in any good American or both Japanese management. Number one, holistic concern to the employees. Number two, long-term approaches to the human resources management and development. Number three, urgent discipline to keep online data structure institutions as simple and plain and flat. Number four, attempt to keep workshops clean, orderly, and safe. Number five, uh, as I, I think I mentioned earlier, an effort to keep Murphy out of the workflows and workshops. And number six, encouragement of more participatory and high involvement styles of management. Number seven, sharing the gains and profit as well as the pains and the burdens. Number eight, and more open communication. These seem to be the area you can identify in any good American or good Japanese company. Of course, having said that, I have to hasten to add there are still uh, remains a lot of differences. Uh, for instance, in Japan, uh, we seem to be more comfortable in accepting any ambiguous or nebulous area because we believe the truth is not in the extremity in the black and white. But the you seem to emphasize, I uh, try to be articulate on this is the black and white for the state state. So when you come to Japan, you try to do business with the Japanese, you seem I find it quite frustrating for some time before you get used to this kind of uh, Japanese uh, tolerance, high degree of ambiguity and nebulous areas. So when the, we ask you the question for those people who've been married, say, more than 20 years, how is a marriage? If your answer is, oh, my marriage is uh, simply one that we just don't believe that you're not telling the truth, because uh, after being married for 20 years, and there should be some ups and downs. But on the other hand, if your answer is on the, the other streams, uh, my marriage is a simple a mistake or failure. We do not uh, believe that you are not telling the truth. You are not telling the truth because uh, there have been some bright moments during the past 20 years of my marriage. But when you say my marriage is a simple, wonderful mistake, then we think you are telling the truth. We, we seem to find the most uh, comfortable in the twilight and the gray zone. So uh, this is one area that you should be very careful, for careful when you want to communicate with the Japanese businessmen. Uh, of course, the younger people are for, for, to speak to a more straightforward way, an out, outspoken way. And this century of Prime Minister Nakasone, because he was so outspoken in Washington, D.C., when he spoke with President Reagan, he was he seems to be very well accepted here in the United States, but he seems to be less uh, welcome back in Japan because of this. <laughs> but anyhow, the, at the same time, uh, you are former president of the University of Hawaii, uh, Dr. Harold Cleveland, the grandson of your president Cleveland, wrote in his very famous book, The Future Executive, I quote, the in future executive must have a higher degree of tolerance for the ambiguity. I think uh, you also share this kind of uh, principle too. And so it's, this is also endorsed by your Columbia University professor, Dr. Werner Berg. Uh, 
And secondly, we have somewhat more, shall we say, uh, 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 prone to or like uh, prone to uh, the the the, uh, the copycat. You know, mm -hmm. in Japan, Japan has been despised and blamed as uh, the number one copycat in the whole world. Yes, we are a very good at imitation. Back in back at my colleges, we used to kid each other on um, our professor to talk this. When your paper is dissertation that's based on one to the resource, we call it this is a meaning. When your papers on, are based on the two resources, we call it uh, indication. When your paper is based on the three resources, uh, we call it uh, research work. <laughs> and that, when your paper is based on the four model, four, three, and four, and a little blended, then we call it real creative work. So uh, <laughs> we are very com more comfortable in imitating and blending and emulating all the best of the whole world. So this is sometimes. Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, regarded uh, 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 as irritating to, to you, but I'm I'm to reading this evening's your newspaper, Evening Sun, uh, which says in this uh, it is it's a much different General Motors now. The reporter says the General Motors Corporation renovating the Baltimore Boeing Highway assembly line is different from the company that built it 48 years ago. It is because stunned by the Japanese auto invasion. Battered by recession, its image tarnished by the suspect quality of its product, GM no longer rules the automotive world. GM shares it. Its workers, once virtual cog in a grinding assembly machine, are now quoted for ideas and suggestions encouraged to join in GM's new production partnership. I think there is some kind of uh, imitation or the emulation from our practice <laughs> and, uh, in the big chat like General Motors. Okay, uh, I think I've been too, speaking too much and taking my colleagues there, but let me just uh, emphasize, uh, philosophize a little bit, the importance of um, uh, the emulation or cross fertilization or mutual learning. And uh, the, we have a saying in Japan, uh, the Sessa Takuma. Sessa Takuma means the best way to uh, enrich ourselves is through mutual grinding and mutual policy. And thank you for your kind attention. Uh, my name is Fujiwara. I'm, uh, <coughs> I'm a staff economist of the uh, private business organization as Dr. Berg introduced. Uh, private business organization named uh, K. Dunden. Uh, let me first explain a few, uh, briefly, the, the function of this organization. And uh, this will give you some note inside how the Japanese industry economy is run. Uh, our organization is a nationwide private business organization and uh, supported financially by the membership. No subsidies from the government or any other place, only the, the member support. Uh, we have about 100, more 100, 100, over 100 trade associations. All the you know, industrial sectors, industrial sectors have their own associations, 100 of them. And also about 800. Uh, major companies are the member of this organization. The three functions. One is the coordination with the government authorities or contact with the government, uh, both administrations and the uh, political parties. Uh, although we have a rather good cooperative relation with the government, but still inside, you know, below the surface, there's a great struggle, serious conflicts of interests, and you no, know, oh, say, fighting between the two parties. The second is the coordination of different interests of different industrial sectors. We have uh, many uh, you know, such kind of problems which covers the uh, 
know, two or three or four different industrial sectors. The third function is uh, you know, coordination or contact with the foreign business, uh, foreign government or foreign business. We receive a uh, lot of uh, so, uh, business group in Japan and uh, we organize uh, the various type of meeting. And we also send uh, different kinds of business groups to foreign countries and contact with them. Okay. <clears throat> um, in this organization, I spent about 20 years, more than 20 years. Uh, I, my case is uh, one of the typical examples of lifelong employment system. I, just after the graduate, the college, I you know entered this organization and uh, has been working for more than 20 years. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the first half, 10 years, I was you know, involved in involved in the international affairs. And at the end of this you know, uh, decade, I was assigned in New York, uh, Washington, D.C. And I lived three years in Washington, D.C. So uh, in Baltimore, I feel uh, very comfortable or feel at home. Uh, anyway, after I came back to Tokyo, I was assigned in domestic industrial areas. So in the past uh, seven or eight years, I was deeply involved in the domestic industry affairs, energy, industrial policy, R&D activities, or, or environment, or that type of matters. So, uh, but the um, last April, the first I was moved to this International Affairs Division again. But anyway, <clears throat> I would like to tell you in internet, domestic, domestic internet, industrial scene, uh, we have a lot of troubles which are not so well informed in foreign countries. So I would like to introduce one example. I was limited in you no know, eight or ten minutes, so I think I should say only, I, I, I might have only one example. This is the aluminum smelting industry. Uh, aluminum smelting was one of the most promising industries for us. Although it originated uh, before the World War II, but no, it began to expand in 1950s or so. And uh, when we graduated college, one of, uh, a few of my friends got a job in aluminum industries, and uh, all of these you know, were envied by the friends. You know, they were very much highly paid, and they had a very promising future. But in 20 years, the situation has been greatly changed. Uh, energy cost increase was the major factor which uh, brought a great uh, impact on Japanese industrial structure. And uh, the aluminum smelting industry was the one of the typical cases which you know, blow so seriously. Five years ago, the industry had a capacity of 1 million and uh, 60, uh, 600,000 tons. And uh, Japan was a big producer of aluminum products. Uh, but, um, no, after the high increase of co uh, high increase of uh, oil and the high increase of electric fares, they lo they lost the competitive comparative advantage, and the import began to expand rather rapidly. So, the Japanese government, uh, our organization, or aluminum industry, or industrial uh, industry which use the aluminum aluminum ingot, and the labor union leaders. All of these you know, people concerned get together at uh, the uh, advisory council to the Ministry of International Trade and the Industry. Uh, this is a very usual institutionalized form in Japan to get together, all the people concerned to get together and exchange information and uh, make uh, some uh, proposal, policy proposal. And uh, in this council, when first policy papers on this industry is that we cannot keep such a big amount of uh, capacity, so uh, but we have to reduce it. So the 
this law input should be exempted from the antitrust law. So they reached conclusion that we should keep one million and one hundred thousand tons. Two years later, though, everyone got aware that we cannot keep such a big amount of capacities because the import you know, continue to expand the Japanese market. So they get together again and they reach, they rewrite the policy proposal, policy papers again. Then this time we want to keep uh, 700,000 tons of capacity. It was only 1981 or 82, at the beginning of 82, this, this proposal was issued. But 1982, the actual production is 350,000 tons. On the other hand, the import increased 1 million and 300,000 tons. 300, tons. Number of major uh, aluminum smelting factories were closed in various parts of Japan. But one thing I'd like to emphasize here is that uh, there's a lot of argument, discussion, how to cope with this you know, serious situation. Uh, so, uh, exemption from the anti monopoly law or some of uh, 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 governmental assistance to the retraining, vocational uh, training for the dislocated workers of aluminum industries. And some of those well, al aluminum smelting companies uh, argue that we should uh, restrict the import from foreign countries. But this uh, policy has not been adopted. Uh, in conclusion, in Japanese industry, uh, we know that we are only a uh, part of this law, so interdependent economy uh, in the world. And the uh, import restriction is the, the policy we should not take, we should not adopt. So, uh, you know, behind, I would like to insist uh, to tell you that behind the, these you know, success, many success stories of Japanese industry, automobile, electronics, or some others, but behind these industry, there's a uh, lots of troubles, uh, uh, problems uh, we deal with. Thank you. Thank you for giving me uh, this opportunity. Uh, for giving me this opportunity to, to, to talk to you, I'm very glad to be here, and I also be frightened or uh, scared uh, because I have almost every day I watch others or I listen to others as a journalist, but I have never been watched by others <laughs> without my wife. <laughs> uh, so, uh, first of all, please let, let me ask you one question to calm myself. Uh, how many of you uh, know the name of our Prime Minister before you came here? Because my colleague told you about my about his name. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm very, very uh, impressed uh, to know how many people are interested in our um, Japanese domestic policy. Thank you very much. Uh, well, today I want to talk about uh, Japanese defense or diplomatic policy, uh, especially about the fact that we Japanese, Japanese are now standing at the turning point. Uh, in this area. Uh, we journalists are often um, be criticized for using such expression like turning point or crisis or so. Um, but now it must be correct to talk about turning point, not I believe. Then what kind of turning point we are now facing? Uh, this is so far uh, we have had our defense or diplomatic policy 
decided mostly by others substantially. Uh, but from now, from now on, uh, we must develop uh, such a policy by ourselves. Uh, that defense policy is one of the most important subjects we must follow. Uh, but I must admit that such policy, particularly new defense policy, has been developed under the suggestion or sometimes under the pressure of the United States. Um, what distinguished uh, defense policy making uh, in Japan from that of other countries is that all new perspectives of defense and the new issues have originated with Japan's ally, the United States. Uh, then, why uh, such things happen? Uh, one of the reasons is your occupation policy. After World War II, we have completely overwhelmed with the grief over uh, our miserable defeat. And at that time, you ordered us not to fight any armed forces again. So we have applied almost all our energy to economic recovery. Uh, later, the world situa situation changed. For example, the Berlin rocket, uh, Korean War, and so on. And you repealed your policy, and you made us to reveal defense forces little by little. But on the other hand, you maintain the initiative uh, on our defense build up. Because the United States were afraid, I think, afraid of Japan, Japan becoming a militaristic giant again. So we've been trying to be obedient to the United States. <laughs> and it is also important that the higher our economic growth rate got, the more earnestly we've got accustomed to such a way of thinking. For example, uh, we have had three defense build-up crimes in the past. Each of them were also in 1957 and 1961 and 1967. And in all of those plans, we could find the very big interest of the United States. However, we cannot follow such the ways of policy making anymore. The world situation has changed dramatically, especially after the Soviet invasion <coughs> into Afghanistan. And we are also cannot dismiss our economic recovery. Our economic power has become too big, too big. And we are not permitted to confine ourselves only in economic activities. Uh, as a result, more Japanese people, Japanese people have begun to think about the sharing the good with Western allied countries much more earnestly than before. Uh, but it is also true that we are now meeting with uh, the difficulty. We debate or uh, dis discuss defense problems nowadays. For example, in our Yomiri newspaper, almost all days national security has been one of the most important subjects in two or three years. But we have been accustomed to complying with the United States, with United States demand, or taking United States advice too much. So it's not so easy for Japanese to know what kind of defense forces we should have, or how we should develop our defense policy. Now we have a defense, uh, we have a newest defense build-up plan, and if we realize it, for example, Japan will become the nation of the West with the second largest number of T-33 uh, anti-submarine petrol vessels of all countries after the United States. But most Japanese cannot understand at all if it is enough or not enough or too many. And as I said, we are now starting at a turning point. I'm sure that we could tie over this, of, um, this, this, 
difficulty someday, but it takes at least two or three years for Japanese to make a consensus. Uh, that's my opinion. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'd like to address the gentleman who's the newspaper person. Uh, what is the percentage of women in Japanese management and what are their prospects? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know exactly so please. <laughs> Japanese is very group oriented and gregarious and clubbish and we are very good at supporting each other. So uh, uh, having following this tradition, I'd like to seriously respond to your question. Uh, this is the one of the most sensitive areas that uh, the, we have some difficulty in responding to the question. But let me first give you the statistics. About four years ago, upon request of NHK, the Japan Broadcasting Corporation, Public Public Corporation, we made a survey of about 1,200 Japanese large corporations. And the result was, the women who were on either executive or some kind of managerial <coughs> job, including the upper uh, echelon of supervisory test jobs, it is only 0.5% of the whole end number of employees. So one uh, 0. It was 0.2%. So one, two out of 1,000 are the women executives, women boss, or female uh, managers. And also, we have to point out that uh, none, the percentage of the women who are in actual workforces in Japan is whose ages are 16 and over. It's only uh, at the neighborhood about 34, 35%. Whereas in the United States, this uh, number is in the neighborhood of about, about 52%. So many more uh, women are engaged in the workforce in the United States. Uh, the, for the first 10 years after they are recruited uh, from the colleges and universities or the uh, senior high school, the, the Japanese companies, most of the companies here, do, do not discriminate at all. The, any no discrimination against women at all for the first 10 years usually to provide safe opportunity, same level of salaries and no discrimination at all. Also incidentally, the Japanese, uh, Japanese government <coughs> constitution says it is illegal if you discriminate against women at all. But after 10 years of services, Japanese employers uh, use various kind of uh, uh, very, very <coughs> delicate or passive or uh, ways of discriminating against women. Uh, different uh, promotion, slow promotion for the women, and uh, less opportunity for the education for the women. So in actuality, there is a de facto discrimination against the women in the Japanese business organization. But when we find out the fact that the usury in the large organization, uh, the female uh, women workers and uh, stay on the job, after they are recruited from the colleges, only on the national average, three points, three months and three years and seven months, they just get leave the places and get married. Of course, there are not a greater number of people the influx again coming after they finished uh, uh, the child bear, child bearing and child rearing, and when they find out the empty nest syndrome, they come back to the world. But however, the, this kind of vicious circle is still going on, and there, but there is different trend to script to remove and eliminate discrimination against the women. For instance, uh, Japanese Supreme Co uh, Court ruled out that it is illegal to discriminate <coughs> against a woman. And also, uh, in the case of Nissan, where they had a separate, different retirement ages for the males and females, it was declared this is illegal. And we had the first Japanese women ambassador to the, the Denmark two years ago. And we have now seen uh, quite a few Japanese executives in the cosmetic industry, Shiseido, and department stores, and some of the large corporations. 
still, I think, in this area, we are much behind you, and we are still the Japanese corporation and organization that may have dominated. We are still seems to be enjoying your what you call MCD status right now. <laughs> I think I'd like to go up on my colleague, uh, Rada. I think he has he's more uh, experience in this area. So, do you want to help? <coughs> um, so when it comes to the export uh, encouragement by the government, uh, before you know, this government actions, I, I should say that uh, for the businessman in Japan, export is the one of the most important you know, conditions, factors. So the, for most of the, uh, the manufacturers, industries, American, such a big market, comes uh, first uh, non uh, overseas market, but for the American manufacturers, such a big domestic market, uh, those so manufacturers are not so much interested in in a foreign market. I think this this difference comes first. And when it comes to the government actions, government actions, government policy actions, today. Uh, so we have the many uh, no, the policy measures taken in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, but uh, it's been great change these days. And when it comes to export, uh, the government is the government role has been greatly declined today. And I don't think that any any specific uh, policy measures to expand Japanese export to foreign countries still alive. And when it comes to America, I suppose, I hope, uh, that many people uh, began to feel that the, or became export-minded. And the trade uh, representative office or Department of Commerce has been greatly interested in assisting the American uh, manufacturer of the industry to export foreign countries. And uh, so, at this moment, I don't think any, uh, in both countries, I don't see any a substantial uh, difference. Uh, let me add a little bit to what my colleague has mentioned. Uh, in the early 50s and early 50s and early 60s, <coughs> excuse me, Japanese government has been able to assist in many ways to the acceleration and promotion of uh, export. For instance, as is evidenced by the fact that the uh, government has provided a special export uh, banks to uh, finance and uh, to assist the financing of in financing uh, in the exportation. Also, Japan uh, has established so-called organization project for Japan external trade organization, which has been instrumental in promoting the various kinds of exportation, but not for the large enterprise, for the small and medium enterprises. Uh, to sell their market to to sell the product to the overseas market, uh, but the however, it is solely and primarily due to the efforts and uh, private sectors of the nine leading so-called social the general trading firms of Japan, uh, Sumitomo, Mitsubishi, Mitsubishi, and and the, the, they you now dominates about the six fifty nine percent of Japanese exportation. And they dominate about uh, close to the 50% of Japanese importation. So, the, even though there has been some assistance to the more or less private, uh, medium size, small size, but it is, I think, I regard the, the, the efforts of the private sector in large sober social, a very general trading firm, which handled from the uh, Mudu to the missiles. <coughs> so, they, they have been instrumental in promoting and uh, exporting overseas market. And uh, in, as of now, the, the share of the export, export against the general GNP, which was national product in the United States, in Japan is, uh, is about uh, eight, 
of HPQ-8 at 9% <coughs> against Hawaii and GNB of Japan. While the Indian United States, you'll be somewhat surprised to find out you have been able to successfully export your products and then from the ratio of exportation against the entire GNB in the United States is close to 12% uh, against the general, uh, <coughs> so the gross GNB. So, the, well, that's what I was looking at. Yes, We have a trading balance now of about $18 billion in labor. And the Japanese say that the reason for that, they say it on the record, of course, is that our factories are sloppy. We don't need our own uh, quality control engineers. We uh, blame the Japanese for this problem instead of looking to our own reconstruction of our own uh, industrial machine. Uh, when you come to Americans, the Americans say that the Japanese are quite hypocritical about this business of free trade, that they talk a good game, but they're not free traders, that their markets are closed, and that they count every baseball bat and test everyone that comes into the, to Japan, and refuse to accept uh, procedures and so forth and so on. Uh, what do you think is the reason for the $18 billion balance? <coughs> Since I'm a student of uh, international business and competitive management, I would like to respond to this question from the, from the, the, from the viewpoint of the, the competitive manage, managerial effort, managerial management that it takes on. I think one of the most important uh, factors which has contributed to this kind of imbalances is, uh, from our point of view, I think I have to endorse your comments or comment of the Japanese officials who have responded to you that uh, there seems to be far less emphasis on the enthusiastically and actively almost aggressively uh, to, to study the market. And uh, the classical example is that uh, when General Motors wanted to come over to the Japanese market, they have never studied the narrow state of Japan, the condition of Japan, and they have never wanted to change the, the left-handed uh, car to the right-handed uh, to the right-handed car, to the left -handed car. So, uh, whereas I think uh, we have uh, done a great deal of job uh, in getting the information, collecting information, and modifying our products in order to be able to focus on a certain uh, market. And so this is one of the big reasons uh, we seem to have uh, produced this kind of difference. But, but I also would like to call up on my colleague in, in the area of uh, different types of importation and exportation because we import uh, about 90% of your soy. So now we import 90% of our soybean from the United States and 96% of uh, wheat and grains from your country. So the difference of, uh, of the quality, quantity or difference of the nature of the importation exportation might have contributed to this negative, unhappy, you know. Just one response is now. If we stick to the bilateralism in international trade, I believe that this will lead to a general decline of the world trade. We have the chronic or long-lasting trade surplus with the United States. But we have a long-lasting chronic trade deficit with Australia, with Canada, with Middle Eastern countries. Overall trade balance of Japan in the past 10 years, we have the five or four or five years of surplus, five or four or six deficits in the past 10 years. So those of monies, <coughs> trade in balance trade, Deficit with Australia, the deficit with uh, Middle Eastern countries. Where these low money will go from Middle Eastern countries, they circulate to the American financial market, and the whole United States has a big trade sur uh, uh, surplus with Australia. I believe that the you know, international economy is moving in such a way, and uh, we should stick to the multinational principle. 
Gentlemen, just one additional brief comment uh, to the question. We had the chance to uh, discuss with your one of your congressman, Paul Simon from Illinois, and uh, he gave us one example that one of the differences which caused this difference of imbalance may be due to the fact that we have, for instance, more English speaking Japanese businessmen, for instance, stationed in New York, it's about in one four thousand. Uh, Japanese English speaking business and marketing, marketers. Whereas in Tokyo, he assumes, he presumes that maybe you can find only 200 Japanese speaking American marketing men. So, sheer number of uh, uh, well, lack of communication or lack of uh, uh, the uh, communication might be one of the differences. And one interesting study which was made available recently, last March. It's a joint work of the Japanese Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Japan, in collaboration with TSD, Task Force, the Task Group of the Japanese, made it clear and uh, that if you have three seats, commitment and uh, the uh, competitiveness and uh, uh, commitment, competitiveness, and uh, what was the last one? Uh, the network security, anyhow, you'll be able to, to be successfully come to the Japanese market. So I do suggest that you can, I think you can find a lot of interesting, good reading, the Japan opportunity and barriers uh, written by the people who step over your McKinsey consultant company. The question has stimulated a flurry of hands, but I'll, I'll take them in the order that I first saw. Mr. Polder. Uh, my question will move you from this area of interest. Uh, to Mr. Sami's very, very candid uh, presentation. Now, you did talk of Japan now wanting to be sort of free of perceived American tutelage, wanting to set up its own defense posture and military establishment. Now, as you do this, you as a perceptive journalist do feel fairly comfortable that in Japan itself exist mechanisms, constitutional, public opinion or otherwise, which would prevent Japan as the most advanced technological country of the world at the moment to relapse into that kind of situation which had developed in the 30s. Because remember now that when Japan entered on military adventure in the 30s, Japan's preeminence as an industrial na nation was not as great as it is now. Uh. I must say first that in my speech, in my uh, address, I I told you that we have begun to thinking about uh, burden sharing in Western camp, and um, and of course I talked about the defense build up, but um, I also think. Uh, uh, I want to. Uh, uh, I think that I also simplify that uh, we are not. We have not decided to uh, to to do what kind of thing. We, you know, especially, we must. Uh, um, we must um, make effort uh, in defense um, field of, of course, but. Uh, we did not. We, we have not decided. Um, for example, um, for example, economic um, aid to developing countries or so. So um, we are now thinking about um, what percentage of uh, 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 energy or money to uh, use in defense forces. Defense development and in economic aid or something we have not decided, but we now uh, began to 
and thinking about the problem and learning. That's what I want to say. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, if we um, we be, if we become uh, we become a militaristic giant again, it must scare um, Asian countries or so. Well, so we must think about it. It it, uh, it is a most one of the most important things when we think about defense build up. So so now we are um, embarrassed. Well, we should say we are. Um, we we had we had um, problems. Uh, what what we should do? Well, what kind of uh, burden we share? Well, please understand that we have not decided to uh, to. Uh, decided not, uh, and decided not to, decided not yet that we, 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 we make up, we make up, make, uh, make up effort mainly to defense forces, uh, defense field. Uh, we are now thinking about, um, that we have not decided fully uh, what we are supposed to, but we have just come to the stage where we have to uh, be, to go, have to go do a real serious thinking as what kind of burden sharing we are supposed to do uh, in, the, in the light of the very, very past uh, unhappy memory in the Far East area and also in the we have suffered immensely, for instance, because of the, all the hardships and uh, we have experienced in Japan and uh, mm -hmm. all these, the Asian people have experienced in the, uh, in the, past, war, in the past World War II. Right? get the job uh, as a economist in that uh, organization was about uh, after that ten years uh, we uh, had a very big target we should uh, trade liberalization well liberalization of capital transactions 
And uh, so uh, we have the rate of import liberalization from that and 45% or so. And this proportion raised gradually to 94%, 96%, 90, 80% or so, especially in industrial goods. We have still several import regulations of agriculture products, beef, uh, citrus, or some other. Right? But I today I think you know, uh, that the whole you know, uh, all the Japanese market to open foreign products. When it, when it comes to uh, some you call the non tight barriers or some very complicated procedures or uh, examination by the government, or when it comes to these things, then the uh, Japanese industry also suffering from this kind of red tape and basically red tape. And our organization now fighting with the government in as a, one of the important parts of the government uh, administrative reform, which has been promoted in the past two years in Japan. And uh, when we uh, send the unpaid uh, you know, uh, questionary form to the all the member companies, we receive uh, thousands, more than the three thousand response from our members. Uh, corporations and uh, many of them are uh, complaining that uh, what the stupid uh, uh, obsolete uh, procedures Japanese government still keep uh, whether to try to you know, abolish or streamline simplify those regulations and we are now doing that we are now very fiercely, uh, fiercely uh, doing that so and these many things which are uh, picked up by the Japanese companies are also uh, working adversely to the foreign traders. And in the case of foreign people, I think it's more uh, difficult to barrier. So the, uh, the, the legal restriction of the import, I don't think there's no anymore. Even though for the shoes that we, we can have, a lot of shoes uh, uh, in Japan, uh, we can buy today a number of American shoes, uh, or well, Taiwan shoes, Korean shoes. Just one comment uh, in response to your specific question about the shoes. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no, almost no, none of any regulations or discrimination against American shoes. We have a, uh, the one way or shoe company called Rigo shoes, Rigo shoes are here in, in Japan, and also uh, the Nike is uh, making a lot of profits in Japan. Uh, to uh, uh, the food, the uh, the coat, the youngsters like my sons, and they're just crazy about the Nike shoes. And so the Adidas gave a special license agreement to produce their type of shoes to the Japanese people. But recently there is a great influx of shoes from Taiwan, Portuguese, Brazil, and we are now suffering. Uh, they are now competing very. Uh, in, the, in the Japanese market. So the first thing you have to do is try to identify the, these kind of high competitive situations in the Japanese market. And you can get good consultation from a Japanese general authority. General used to be just promoting the Japanese shoes out, out to outside, but now general is to commit to itself, to dedicate itself to assist the American exportation to the Japanese market. So you can find a, good, a bit of advice, good advice from Mr. Hirai, based in New York City, general. One last question. I'm curious about your relationship with your Asian neighbors. Uh, on the defense matter, are your Asian neighbors very concerned about the military Let me respond to your question initially. I've been greatly involved with various kinds of projects in the, with our nation, ASEAN neighbors, particularly with the Asian neighbor, ASEAN five countries. And uh, officially, they usually all the, the leaders of these countries used to say and still say that uh, they are very much concerned with the revival of the uh, great age of prosperity sphere and things. Something happened that changed, there's a slight change after our Prime Minister Nakasone uh, was sworn in the cabinet prime minister. It was only last year, I think very correctly, in October, uh, President Marcos expressed his great concern to the Japanese uh, military build-up. 
But this time, uh, Marx was not. But then Marx did something else. Uh, he did not necessarily believe in the so-called uh, uh, recovery of uh, uh, the, the, the reputation, the position of the bad old days dream. But, so what this officially seems to endorse my concern, but still by my, I myself personally have a lot of anxiety uh, because of <coughs> possible the negative impact which the Japanese uh, Nintendo Bilbao might give to all these neighboring nations. There seems to be some kind of discrepancies uh, or change of ideas of some of the leaders uh, in the Asian countries. What they say and what they used to say, there seems to be slight and dip, uh, delicate difference. I don't know what kind of uh, development there might be, but they have to. And in our relationship with the ASEAN countries, uh, particularly, uh, we have a deep involved with the, with the ASEAN, ASEAN and Asian brothers and sisters. Because, for instance, let's take an example of uh, Indonesia. The Indonesia's export is about 48% of Indonesia's export is dependent on Japan and really uh, dependent on the on their supply, constant supply supply of petroleum, about uh, 30, 40% of uh, 15% of the oil comes from Indonesia. So we've been getting more, so the interdependent relations now. I apologize. Oh, of course. Uh, I, 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 I agree with him. Uh, um, um, uh, the Asian countries are now becoming afraid of of uh, Japan becoming a giant, giant military giant. Um, and I told you about our burden um, uh, sharing, but uh, even if we uh, make, make much effort to share both uh, with the with allied countries, we have some uh, condition to uh, limitation. We, we will never repeal in the future. Uh, for example, uh, we will never make nuclear weapons. That's it. That's one of it. And uh, it is also very important uh, condition that we will never scare the Asian people. Yeah. May I one quick response to the question or comments raised by someone on the matter of yen our exchange rate. No Japanese businessman believes that the Japanese government has, has some ability to give an uh, important influence on the exchange rate fluctuation today in Japan. And also, Japanese industries, economies, so proliferated, diversified, importer, exporters. And if the government did something on some certain direction, some will be get a great benefit, but some will get a great loss. But very serious conflict inside Japan. So I myself don't believe the Japanese uh, government has any such ability to give an influence on the actual project. I apologize to all of you who had questions and weren't able to ask them. Gentlemen, we appreciate uh, the thoroughness of your introductory statements, which were of great interest, and for the very full and careful and respectful answer uh, which you've given to our questions. Thank you very much for sharing your